Good afternoon and welcome to Engineers Week 2021, Imagining Tomorrow. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center and we are going to be your technical support behind the scenes with today's event. I'm going to turn things over to Greg Boyer in just a second, but I would like to ask you to please take a look at your GoToWebinar panel before we begin and find the question area and please drop me a hi or hello in the question box so I know that you found it. That is how we are asking that you please submit any questions you have for our presenters during today's presentation. Also, during the presentation, a copy of the PowerPoint, which was shown before the event started, will be loaded into the handout section for you to download if you would like to have a copy of that. It will also be emailed out after the session completes today. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Greg. It's all yours. Thank you, Victoria. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 70th Annual Central Ohio Engineers Week Luncheon where the theme this year is Imagining Tomorrow. In the spirit of Engineers Week, I like to think of it as Engineering Tomorrow. My name is Greg Boyer, and I'm a board member of the Association of Bridge Construction and Design, otherwise known as ABCD. Our society, along with 10 other central professional societies, have representatives from each group who work together to plan for this annual event. As most of you know, we typically hold the event at a banquet hall, but due to the pandemic, we are presenting it as a virtual luncheon. Today, we have two talented young local leaders providing presentations within our theme of Imagining Tomorrow. Before we introduce our featured speakers, we have a few other presenters. First will be our Franklin County engineer, Cornell Robertson, who will lead us with an invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Following Cornell, we will have the Ohio Department of Transportation Director, Dr. Jack Marchabanks, who will give a pronouncement formally honoring Engineers Week on ODOT's behalf. A colleague of mine, Julia Hart from ABCV, will then share a mini bridge competition held last weekend with local high school students and announce the award winners. So again, welcome. And now our Franklin County Engineer, Cornell Robertson. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to the various engineering clubs and organizations for holding the E-Week luncheon, even if only in the virtual sense. Again, my name is Cornell Robertson. Usually, I introduce myself as the county engineer, but today, I'll go with the Franklin County Imagineer. The mission of the Franklin County Imagineer's office is to provide for safe and efficient movement of people and goods from place to place by designing, building, and maintaining Franklin County's 800 lane miles of roads, 360 bridges, and infrastructure for multiple modes of transportation. We are an agency of action, innovation, and collaboration. And we certainly appreciate the collaboration with you all, consultants, contractors, and the entire imagineering industry. On a personal level, the three things most important to me are my spiritual faith, honoring our country, and my family. Therefore, it's an honor and privilege for me to deliver the invocation and lead the Pledge of Allegiance. As we bow our hearts, I invite you to think of the deity of your choice. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for allowing us to stay connected and to virtually be together for this annual e-week luncheon. May it be an opportunity to broaden our horizons, to be enlightened, and to share vision for the future. Day by day, help us to be people of action and servant leaders in your image, to utilize creative goodness for the sake of others, at work, at home, and everywhere we go. Give us the strength, the courage, and the comfort to know that your will is best. In God's name we pray, amen. Thank you. And now for the Pledge of Allegiance. As we say the pledge today, I ask that it be dedicated to our youth, those who may be considering careers in engineering and imagineering. They are our future. They are our tomorrow. I invite you to stand as you are able or to kneel in peace if you prefer 
to honor our flag and to honor our country. Please join me and follow my lead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. In closing, thank you again to the various Imagineering clubs and organizations for holding an e-week virtual luncheon. I'll end my portion of the program with a public service announcement. Let's all do what we can to end distracted driving. Don't text while driving. Don't talk on the phone. Don't eat cereal. Don't brush your teeth while driving and on and on and on. But also know before you go, use your handy dandy Franklin County Roadmap to determine your route or punch your destination into your Garmin before you set sail. Signing off for now, again, my name is Cornell Robertson, your Franklin County Imagineer. Thank you, Cornell. We really appreciate that. And now I would like to introduce our Ohio Department of Transportation Director, Dr. Jack Marchbanks. Thank you, Greg. On behalf of the Ohio Department of Transportation, I would like to acknowledge Ohio Engineers Week. Founded by the National Society of Professional Engineers in 1951, National Engineers Week this year from February 21st through February 27th is dedicated to ensuring a diverse and well-educated future engineering workforce by increasing understanding of and interest in engineering and technology careers. According to the National Society of Professional Engineers, Engineers Week is supported today by a national coalition of more than 70 engineering, education, and cultural societies, and more than 50 corporations and government agencies. The week is dedicated to raising public awareness of engineers' positive contribution to the quality of life. It also promotes recognition among parents, teachers, and students of the importance of a technical education and a high level of math, science, and technology literacy with a goal of motivating our youth to pursue engineering careers in order to provide a diverse and vigorous engineering workforce. Thousands of schools, businesses, and community groups are reached across the United States annually during Engineers Week. Engineers are a vital component to Ohio's strength. They spur progress and development in important areas, including technology, transportation, communication, natural resources, natural resources and also contribute to Ohio's economic growth and job creation. Engineers apply their scientific and technical knowledge and skills in creative and innovative ways to support the survival of humanity and to improve their quality of life and, of course, to solve problems. Engineers face the major technological challenges of our time, from rebuilding towns devastated by natural disasters to harnessing fuel sources for coming generations. Many products of Ohio engineering are highly visible to the state's citizenry, from safer highways to the next generation of aircraft, from solar panels and windmills to natural gas, petroleum, and coal. Ohio employs numerous engineers whose work is often invisible to the public who directly benefit from it and are therefore worthy of special recognition. We will look more than ever to Ohio's engineers and their knowledge and skills to meet the challenges of the future. Ohio's professional engineers work diligently and conscientiously to safeguard the public health, safety, and welfare. We encourage the students to pursue engineering skills and careers and thank the teachers and parents for facilitating these skills. The host organization of the Columbus Engineers Week event is the local chapter of the Association for the Con Bridge Construction and Design. The planning committee Additionally, it includes representatives from the local chapters of the Society of Professional Engineers, American Society of Professional Engineers, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the Women's Transportation Seminar, the Engineers Club of Columbus, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, American Society of Highway Engineers, American Public, American Public Works Association, American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and last but not least, the American Council of Engineering Companies. 
the engineering professional societies provide awareness and support for the engineering professions. The Columbus Engineers Week Committee would like to welcome you to the 70th annual Central Ohio National Engineers Week virtual luncheon. Back to you, Greg. Thank you, Director Marchbanks, for that wonderful acknowledgement. And just to let the audience know, we also received a resolution from the Ohio Senate honoring the Ohio Society of Professional Engineers on its observation of Engineers Week. Thank you, Senators Huffman and Blessing. And now, I'd like to introduce Julia Hart from the Association of Bridge Construction and Design. We'll give a recap of the mini bridge competition from last weekend. Julia, how did our future bridge engineers do? Thanks, Greg. So um, our event took place on Saturday, and I am very thankful to the Engineers Weeks Committee to include us in this event today. We actually had 16 teams, which was more than I had expected, um, being that this was a completely virtual event. Um, this marked our first, hopefully to be annual, Central Ohio Miniature Bridge Competition. The event has been a long time in planning for the Association for Bridge Construction and Design Group in Central Ohio. I think we started talking about it three to four years ago. We almost had the event last year, but we had to postpone it because, uh, well, actually had to cancel it because of COVID. And you know, we are always, as an engineering group, looking for ways to interact with future engineers. So I was one of those crazy people who knew from a young age that I wanted to be an engineer. And I was lucky to have a very supportive environment around me growing up. I have a lot of engineers in my family and people who are involved in construction. So I had um, this crazy family of engineers and, and contractors and construction workers who fostered me in um, helping me to become the engineer that I am today. And I hope with this event and its continuation throughout the years that we as a blended engineering family can help foster that same desire in the youngsters who may not have that same support that I was lucky enough to have. This event would not have been possible without our many sponsors and especially our planning committee. Our diamond sponsor, Cornell Robertson, really enabled us to bring this event to life through both a monetary donation, his team's commit, committee involvement, and the use of the county's Zoom platform for us to be able to present the event on Saturday. There's a sincere thank you that has to go out to Franklin County. Um, you know, this event really um, was brought, by, uh, brought on by you guys. In addition, the event would not have been possible without the support of our gold sponsors, Gannett Fleming, GPD, 2LMN, and Resource Engineering. Our silver sponsors, TRC, Fishbeck, Fishbeck, sorry, Prime AE, and OSU. And our bronze sponsors, HDR, Tim Keller, Matt Blythe, Angela Troutman, Dr. Herr, and Ed Herrick. Um, some of these sponsors have been with us since last year. Um, and allowed us to hold their donations to this year. And we greatly appreciate that. That helped us to get um, off the ground and running very quickly to get this project or this uh, competition um, on the books for this Engineers Week. Our committee deserves extra kudos. We've been planning this event, as I said, for about two years now, having to cancel last year due to the COVID shutdown. There's a special thank you um, for your dedication uh, to this event to our committee. Our committee is made up of Dr. Herr, from OSU's Civil, Environmental, and Geodetic Engineering Department, Chris Hay from ABCD, Abby Zimmer from ODOT District 6, Ed Herrick and, and, Ed Herrick and Simone Burley from the Franklin County Engineer's Office. Um, you really made this event happen, and thank you so much for your support, your, your assistance, all your great ideas, and especially for your enthusiasm in um, bringing this uh, event to um, life. There's also a special thank you that has to go out to Matt Hay, for designing and constructing our loading table and to Brad Sunheimer and Eagle Construction for providing us with some loading material to actually test our bridges. And a final thank you and heartfelt thank you to the teachers, chaperones, and students who took a chance on us and were patient with us in getting this event off the ground and for giving this first year a, a try or a go. Um, I hope you found it worthwhile and consider participating next year. We've already received some great feedback from some of the teachers um, and they're already um, asking to please, please let us uh, reach out to them again for next year's event. So it's truly amazing at how many people had to come together to make this event happen. And again, it would not have been possible without all those people that I just named. So our bridges were judged on aesthetics, but also on their efficiency or failure, um, or their efficiency or failure load to bridge weight ratio. And now it's my pleasure to announce our winners. The Aesthetic Award, which is presented by 2LMN, 
goes to team one of St. Charles Preparatory School. The third place efficiency award presented by GPD goes to um, team We Tried LLC of Fayette Christian School. And I have to say coming in third is your first time. I'd say you definitely tried. Um, second place efficiency award go, presented by Gannett Fleming goes to team four of Central Crossing High School. And the first place and overall winner, which is presented by the Franklin County Engineer, is team one of St. Charles Preparatory School. Congratulations, we had some really amazing bridges this year. And if you are interested in seeing any photos of the bridges or an entire um, video of the loading event that occurred on Saturday, please go to the ABCD um, Central Ohio website and click on our outreach page. And now we have a short video that we're gonna show of the first place bridge being loaded. Looks like it's pretty darn sturdy. Like it's Boeing? I didn't hear any talking sounds. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it usually you, you tells you that. Yeah. Good morning. What's the student's name? Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's. You did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was like, sometimes you don't get much on it. <laughs> The, st the stiffer they are, the more the less you get. Okay. Okay. So, and there you have it. That is our first place bridge um, being loaded. As you can see, it was kind of a catastrophic failure there at the end. And that bridge actually held um, nearly 14,000 grams and it weighed 28 um, grams. So great job, St. Charles. And thank you again to everyone that I mentioned, our sponsors, our committee, and especially the students. Um, we are already looking forward to our next year's event. Um, we're always looking for people to help out with the event. And we're also always looking for ways to interact with the younger students. So if you have a kid who's in high school or grade school and they'd like to learn more about engineering, please direct them to the ABCD outreach um, and let us know ways that we can interact with those students and their teachers. Thank you so much. And thank you, Julia, for all your hard work planning and organizing that event. That's, uh, that's well done, great stuff. And congratulations to all the students that participated as well. And now um, I would like to introduce our first featured speaker today, Mandy Bishop. Mandy Bishop serves as Deputy Director of Public Service assigned as the Smart Columbus Program Manager. Mandy joined the City of Columbus in July 2017. She uses her 22 years of industry experience with an emphasis on complex project management to lead the delivery of the USDOT. Vulcan and American Climate Change Challenge Transportation Actions and Programs. Mandy also oversees Finance, Human Resources, and Vision Zero for the department. Prior to joining Columbus, Mandy was a consultant with GPD Group and served in a number of roles, including serving as the staff lead for the Governor's 21st Century Priorities Task Force and later as Deputy Director of Planning for ODOT. Mandy holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the Ohio State University and is a registered Ohio professional engineer and survey intern. Mandy is also a WTS International and ASHI member. Ladies and gentlemen, Mandy Bishop. Thanks, Greg. Um, it was so great to hear from Julia today about so many um, participants wanting to be in engineering and participating in the bridge program. So that was really exciting for me. And I just want to thank um, all the eWeek organizer, organizers for inviting me here today uh, to share some, some context around what I think engineers can do to have some impact in their communities as we are imagining tomorrow. 
um, any, it's always, I'm always very humbled and thankful for the interest um, in Smart Columbus and the work that we do at the Department of Public Service. And I look forward to sharing with you guys today. <clears throat> so I'm certain so many of you recognize this picture. And for those of the, you that don't, it's the Scioto Mile in downtown Columbus. Um, it's one of the many great spaces and places in central Ohio. Um, and it's one of hundreds of examples of projects that take place in central Ohio every single year. Um, it's a, an example, it's a compilation of work from planners, landscape architects, architects, uh, engineers all came together to envision this wonderful, great space. I noticed the Main Street Bridge. Uh, I noticed COSI. I know the Veterans Memorial. I noticed the Veterans Memorial, Smart Columbus, City Hall. There are so many iconic uh, buildings and, and places in this photo. Um, this project is a great example of public and private collaboration. Um, and it's an example of what we can do as a community when we all come together uh, for a common purpose, we can really build those great places and spaces. And so this is the very same view. And I'm certain that many of you, uh, I'm certain that many of you can see some differences in this particular photo. So if you would just throw some of those in the chat box, what are you seeing that's different from the previous photo? I'm sure some of you are going to throw in there, you see fireworks. Well, the photo is taken at dusk or at night. Um, the lighting's amazing. Um, some of you might say the space is activated. And so what I really noticed was there, was there were people in this photo. There are people enjoying the project. There are people enjoying the space uh, that engineers help build. And so what I really want what I really want to talk about is the people that we serve and what we can do as engineers to really design, build, and launch projects with, with people and therefore equity and accessibility in mind. I can pull probably a dozen quotes from Mayor Genther. Um, mobility is a great equalizer of the 21st century. Uh, the impact of climate change isn't just happening on faraway shores. Um, and it affects our most vulnerable. It's these quotes that really resonate the most with me. It's the ones that connect to people and really um, let you know what he's all about. He's all about helping us uh, solve challenges that our residents are facing every single day. He's about the people. And so when we won the Smart City Challenge, um, really from the time of application, leaders like Director Jennifer Gallagher um, led a team that was uh, had many participants, including the Columbus Partnership, Central Ohio Transit Authority, Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, Franklin County Engineer's Office, Drive Ohio, et cetera. Um, we, were, uh, we were really thinking about uh, ways we could solve people cha people's challenges with this award. It was a great excitement, but it was also a great responsibility to leverage these funds um, in a way that really served our community and not just demonstrate technology for technology's sake. And so I'm going to talk through just a few projects today um, and share a little bit about those of the Smart City Challenge and some other projects that I'm working on. And one of those projects is our self-driving shuttle uh, project. We have a connected electric autonomous vehicle project that is currently deployed in Linden. Um, and the goal of this deployment was really to demonstrate how autonomous technology um, can connect residents to jobs and uh, uh, services, community services. And so that's really what we've done. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to do was launch a service that could uh, bring, serve the community and not, again, demonstrate for technology, tech for technology's sake. Um, we launched what the Linden Leap, Linden Empowers All People in February of 2020. And we were really looking to improve safety and mobility of travelers in mitigating the first mile, last mile challenges. We were looking to ensure equitable and accessible options. And we were also looking to encourage transit growth and, and really grow that code of ridership. So we deployed in Linden 
And it was to much excitement, the community was engaged, and we were really looking to serve the residents of Linden. Our first service um, was connected uh, from the Linden Transit Center along Cleveland Avenue and connected all the way up to St. Stephen's Community House where people could access food services, job services, health care, uh, child care services, um, all that really someone might need uh, to live their live their life and access the other support services that they they needed as well. And lo and behold, in our first weeks of operation, we had a an unexplained braking incident. The shuttle just stopped abruptly, um, and ultimately, it, um, a passenger tumbled forward and hurt her leg. And so we had an immediate stoppage of the passenger service in uh, mid to late February. And we really had to step back. First and foremost, we wanted to make sure our passenger was okay. And we wanted to make sure that future passengers were okay. So we implemented our safety management plan. We brought in our partners to, to review what happened and what we could have done to A, prevent it, and then B, how we can mitigate it moving forward. Thank you to Drive Ohio. Thank you to uh, CODA for helping us with that review. And these were the things that we really had to assess as we worked to get back to passenger service. Well, lo and behold, coronavirus comes and there's a global pandemic and moving people may not be safe in a space that we certainly can, we can't get six foot of separation. We definitely are gonna need masks and we needed some time to really figure that out but in the interim, we have these shuttles that are working, that um, are no longer connecting people to the services they need, and they now need some of those more than ever, including food service. And so one of the things we did during the pandemic was um, look to see how we could serve the residents of Linden using the shuttle. And so we pivoted to food distribution. Many of us saw long lines across the United States um, food pantry demand was increasing two, three, four fold. People that had never even thought of going to a food bank before were going. Um, so the Linden Leap service really helped um, uh, all, uh, more people access a food, but also helped more people um, socially distance by moving some of the uh, pickup, uh, the food away from the central uh, St. Stephen's Community House. And that was really something that we did to try to serve our residents by using our technology to solve a problem that we were facing. We were trying to be nimble and, and move that along. These are just a few pictures of the service that we're providing. We're using our one of our self-driving shuttles here. Uh, Irv is in the middle. He's one of our operators from Empower Bus. And now he's with Easy Mile, still continuing this food service operation. Um, but we really did it all to serve people. Another project that was probably one of my favorite projects to work on, work on was our mobility assistance for, for people with cognitive disabilities. And this particular project um, really focused on people with cognitive impairment, and that's defined as autism, uh, people with autism, Down syndrome, traumatic brain injury, dementia, uh, ADD is in there, um, dyslexia, learning disabilities. It has a very broad definition, and therefore, this type of technology has the opportunity to serve a lot of people, including the elderly, um, including the elderly. And so we were really looking to help uh, people with disabilities garner more independence in their um, daily lives. And so we really looked to a Wayfinder ecosystem where we had a handheld device, so a phone, we had participants that wanted to use this uh, application that we put on a cell phone and that it could, they could access um, fixed route transit while doing it. So this was our Wayfinder ecosystem where we looked to try to solve some of those challenges that we were seeing our residents with cognitive impairment hold. And we really wanted that person-centered um, service. So this, serv this service, you can build custom routes in the application, again, called Wayfinder by AbleLink. Um, and it has visual and audio uh, cues for those that want to access fixed route uh, transit. They can, you know, get on that, that bus and have some confidence that they're going to be able to travel from point A to point B. And it gives them more information along the way to continually orient them. And also has some great features for the caregivers 
caregivers are part of this ecosystem as well. And it really helps connect the caregiver with their um, person so that they can help them navigate the system. Um, so some great technology for this. These are the folks that we were really trying to serve. Um, we got to know a number of folks in the program, including Charlie. Um, we had some great feedback about folks being able to leverage and use um, the Wayfinder app to do some of the things that they wanted to do that weren't necessarily pre-scheduled. Um, one of our most uh, vocal and joyous interns um, was Jose, and he's in the left-hand picture with a group with his caregiver, um, Josh. Um, and Jose, he could not stop talking about the North Market. He got to get on the bus, go to the North Market, and experience things that you and I would take for granted every every single day. It was the smells, it was the taste, it was the textures. It was just experiencing a place that he never um, accessed before. I want to be clear, his caregiver was with him doing these trips as well. But ultimately, it's that independence and those uh, last minute trips to get ice cream that are some of the things that we're trying to help solve for and give people more opportunity to do things when they want to do them, not when they can schedule to do them. And so that was just a little bit about Smart Columbus. And one of the, opportun one of the opportunities that I've been given recently was um, to lead Vision Zero with Maria Cantrell. She's our Vision Zero coordinator and has put in an amazing amount of work uh, into this program. And what we're really trying to do with Vision Zero is eliminate serious injury and death um, on our streets. And that sounds like a very tall order, but if you don't aim high, you're never gonna get there. And we truly feel um, that every single person has the right, every single person has the right to get to their destination safely. And, some, and sometimes those people don't always get to their destination safely. And that's why we're doing this. And so traffic deaths in Columbus, um, we had 54 deaths in 2019 in 49 crashes. And as you can see, the trend has been up for since 2015. And in 2020, um, this is not a final number for 2020, we're trending towards 60 deaths. One death is too many, 60 is just unacceptable. And we can't continue this trend because every, every number on that screen is a person and this is about people and it's about making sure that they get home every day and so on monday we are um, working with city council to adopt our first ever vision zero action plan this is just a preview of a couple pages um, if you want to learn more about vision zero i strongly encourage you to go later this week or uh, on monday to check out the new website the new launch and all the new information at columbus.gov vision zero and you can really see what we're trying to work towards and how we're trying to make people safer um, as they travel on our streets every single person should be safe on columbus street one of the other initiatives that's being undertaken by others in the department being led uh, by Director Gallagher, uh, CEO, President and CEO Joanna Pinkerton at CODA, and Executive Director William Murdoch is the Link Us Initiative Mobility uh, Corridor Initiative. And this initiative, you know, I, is about transportation, but it's not. It's really about um, new technology solutions by competitive uh, improvements as well as well as new housing and job opportunities and it's really an opportunity to tra transform the way we do development in central Ohio so we as we think about the region's challenges it's not just getting people to play at to places it's also bringing place to people and it's working to provide affordable housing and stronger job opportunities so that people can take care of their family and every day engineers play a role in that work. And so what is a mobility corridor? It's a mobility infrastructure investment, it's compact and connected development, and it's increased opportunity for people. And this is all work that engineers, planners, 
contractors, consultants are going to have the opportunity to to uh, play in moving forward and really help move our region forward and give more opportunity and uh, and access for all. I know there's a survey out right now, um, and if you would help out Justin Goodwin and go check out linkuscolumbus.com, find the Northwest uh, Corridor Survey, take a few minutes and look over the documents and give us your feedback. That closes on Monday. So it'd be great if you could do that in the next couple days for us. And I think the one group of people that I want to make sure that I really don't forget in this entire conversation is um, the people you work with, your team members, your peers, the people you supervise, um, your partners, um, your vendors. Uh, when we think about um, the last year, I believe empathetic leadership has really become a, a more prominent topic in many of our conversations as we've all watched people move from home and struggle with childcare and uh, taking care of their families during this pandemic. I've really seen some awesome uh, leaders in our community step up and uh, adapt to that changing condition and help really under and try to really understand where everybody was coming from. And so, when you think about the national conversation, think about equity. Think about how you're making your workplace more equitable and accessible. Think about how you're um, taking care of your employees because they're the ones that are out there serving the public. Again, whether you be a public service servant, a contractor that does public work, a consultant that helps us design um, and plan things as well. And those, those are people that we really have to also remember as we move forward. And so about two, about two years ago, I was just, you know, I was working really hard on Smart Columbus and we were all really focused on delivering the technology and, you know, I was, I, I it just was really struggling a little bit and I uh, needed to remind myself why I do all of this. And so I put this little sticky, this little uh, desktop sticky note on my computer and it's do it for people, do it for purpose. And so that's why every single day I get up and I go out there and do what I do. I love what I do as an engineer, don't get me wrong. But I also, every single day, go out there and give it my all because I want to make this world a little better place. And so I just want to let everyone know that's watching today that you have an opportunity to make an impact. It doesn't matter if you're an entry level uh, engineer or a CEO, it doesn't matter who you are and who you, or who you work for, contractor, consultant, public servant, um, you have the opportunity to change the world. And when you're imagining tomorrow and you're creating that next, you're doing, delivering that next project, building that next space or place, it's really you um, helping build a better tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Really appreciate your passion there. Um, so far, no questions have come in. Does, uh, does the audience have anything they want to ask Mandy right now while she's available? Again, you can use that chat feature there in the uh, upper right-hand corner. Somebody just uh, commented, Mandy's passion is contagious. I agree. Good stuff. Well, I'll tell you what, Mandy, uh, if you wouldn't mind sticking around, uh, maybe if the audience has questions for Mandy after our uh, second uh, presentation, maybe we can uh, we can address those. No um, problem. Mandy? Okay, thank you again, Mandy. Okay, uh, so moving on to our second presenter, uh, I'd like to introduce Joanna M. Pinkerton. Joanna Pinkerton is the president and CEO of the Central Ohio Transit Authority, otherwise known as CODA. It's the regional mobility organization providing services to Columbus and Central Ohio, with a service area covering 562 square miles across five counties serving 1.2 million residents. CODA employs more than 1,100 team members and provides more than 19 million passenger trips in 2019. Since joining CODA in April of 2018, Joanna has focused on organizational transformation, delivering innovative mobility solutions 
in response to a growing community, changing customer preferences and addressing equity issues with the mobility needs of many residents. Highlights of her tenure include leading CODA's first ever strategic planning process, overseeing the creation of a new customer service experience center, recruitment of the organization's first ever chief innovation officer, chief people officer, and chief equality officer, and launching CODA plus mainstream on-demand and bus on-demand, the first on-demand public microtransit and high capacity services in central Ohio. Joanna is a champion for equity, diversity, and inclusion, values which are the cornerstone of CODA's strategic approach to identify evolving needs in the community and pair them with the rapid pace of technology development. Recognitions CODA has received under her leadership include Best Companies for Women to Advance by Parity.org, Outstanding Diversity Organization by Columbus Business First, and named the Outstanding Public Transportation System in 2018 and 2020 by the American Public Transportation Association, making CODA the first transit system to receive this award twice in three years. Joanna joined CODA with more than 20 years in the engineering and transportation industries. Most recently, she served as the Chief Operations Officer at the Transportation Research Center, Incorporated, the nation's largest independent automotive proving ground in vehicle development and testing center and home to the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Highway Transportation Safety Administration Vehicle Research Test Center. Her previous experience also includes leadership roles with The Ohio State University, first as the Senior Associate Director of The Ohio State University Center for Automotive Research, and later as the co-director of the Honda Ohio State Partnership, the nation's largest industry academic based partnership. Prior to her tenure at the Ohio State University, Joanna was the Central Ohio Regional Manager for the Ohio Department of Transportation, where she was responsible for targeting transportation investments to support economic growth in the manufacturing, technology, and logistics industries in Ohio. Joanna is a nationally recognized for her expertise in addressing the challenges the mobility industry is currently facing, including the focus of equity and community transformation when deploying new technology. As an award-winning organization, CODA is focused on how to address digital transformation issues for public infrastructure, opportunities for all AI integration, cybersecurity concerns, and how technology can help protect and serve more people more efficiently. Joanna currently serves on 14 boards and committees. I will repeat, 14 boards and committees. Joanna is a lifelong resident of Central Ohio, holds a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, and is a professionally licensed engineer in the state of Ohio. Welcome, Joanna. <laughs> uh, thank you, Greg, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm, re I'm recovering from that 14 number. I guess I didn't realize that, but um, I can hear people next door who are watching the webinar laughing out loud. So I, I hope you all are enjoying your day. And I just really thank you, Greg, for inviting me to be here. Um, I want to also acknowledge I was really inspired um, by Cornell and Julia and Director Marchbanks, but, um, who mentioned the youth. And as I've been watching today's events, I've been really taken back to what got me into engineering to begin with. Uh, because that was not something that you know most young girls were taught in the 80s and 90s that you should be an engineer um, but I'm, I'm so grateful that my path led to engineering and so i'm i'm really grateful that cornell and julian director um, marchbanks brought up how important it is for each of us to want to inspire the next generation um, but then also i just feel like i owe a huge thanks for, to mandy and what she presented um, for those of you listening in today, she and I did not plan our presentations. We have not uh, coordinated, uh, but yet a lot of what she said really resonated with me, you know, as a, as a person, as a human, as a mother, um, as a colleague, a fellow engineer. I hope it did resonate with you as well. And I heard her to say two things really about engineering is that we have to be thinking about the why and we have to be thinking about the people. 
that we're uh, engineering for. So I'm going to continue that conversation. Um, I'm going to start by sharing with you. I think Mandy did this. She shared a quote that's on her laptop. I suspect if you're all meticulous engineers, such as um, all of us um, are, you probably do things like this too to remind yourself. And so I'm going to read you the the sticky note that is on my laptop. And if you don't have one, I'd say um, give it a try. Um, but I I um, I'll share this quote with you. It says, I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but I can still do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. And that was written by a philosopher in the 1800s, but I wrote that down when I came across it last May and June when I was watching civil unrest outside the window of my office and I was watching a lot of people hurting during the uh, protests. And I thought, what is my role in all of this? And that is there every day to remind me that we all have a role to play. So uh, I am an engineer by training. I'm a civil engineer, but I'm gonna hone in on mobility today. My days of water and sewer and things like that are over, <laughs> maybe thankfully. Uh, if we can go ahead to the next slide. I just want to start with our vision here at CODA because I think it really speaks to the why. Um, our vision here, part of our new strategic plan is to move every life forward. And this really came out of a lot of conversations with engineers and planners and business leaders because we have to be thinking about why we are building the systems and the things we're building. And my commitment is that I will use my engineering talent to move every life forward. So our mission here at CODA, uh, we, we provide solutions that connect people to prosperity through innovation and dedication and teamwork. Um, Greg already mentioned it, uh, we're a 562 square mile uh, service territory and we cover more than 1.2 million residents. And I don't think people realize we actually stretch into portions of ad adjacent counties. And we have a renewed focus now on connecting technology systems uh, to people. I think Greg already mentioned this, but it would be remiss of me if I did not give a shout out to our people. We have been the only transit agency in the nation to be named the number one champions two times in three years. So proud of our people. Some stats here about CODA, uh, more than 1,100 employees. 711 of those are operators, so frontline. Not a single one of them has worked from home. During the entire pandemic, every single one of them has showed up to work every day. And we have not discontinued service a single day during the pandemic. Our fleet is at roughly 500 vehicles at the moment. 212 of those are eco-friendly. And you'll see later on, we've got a plan to be low and no emissions within just a couple years. 42 routes, more than 3,000 transit stops. If you're interested in adopting a stop, look me up at the end of the chat. <laughs> Um, some stats about us, I don't think most people know, we served almost 20 million rides in 2019, pre-pandemic. During the pandemic, we suspended uh, a good portion of some of our services and intentionally suppressed service to 50% capacity uh, until there was more science. There was a lot of unknowns, I'm sure, as you all remember. There wasn't a lot of information and there wasn't a lot of leadership. So we wanted to make sure we protected customers and employees first. So we provided about 10 million trips last year, which is still a lot considering in theory, people were at home, uh, but we served a lot of essential workers, uh, people going to frontline jobs, people who served and made sure that the rest of us were safe. Weekly average ridership at the moment is almost 200,000 people a week. And you'll see there on the right hand side, I'll mention what a little bit about microtransit, Coda Plus, we served more than 17,000 trips on a brand new service of microtransit here in Central Ohio. So I'll bring you up to speed on that. Just a quick overview of our strategic plan. I want to notice, or I'd like to point out, that there are four strategic pillars of our strategic plan. And all businesses go through this type of iteration, you know, this kind of soul searching to make sure that you're focused on what matters. But I want to point out the gear there in the middle. Equity, diversity, and inclusion is not one of the four guiding principles at CODA. 
And that might sound a little shocking, but I want to point that out that it's the foundational element that all of the other strategic uh, priorities are built on. We actually had a debate here about it being one of five strategic uh, priorities. And we realized that when we talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, and you put it as a priority or a principle, then you make it a box for people to check. And I think we all know about that. We have DBE requirements to meet. We have boxes we have to check on contracts. And we didn't wanna make this a box issue. We wanted to make sure that this is the platform by which we reimagine and re-engineer everything we do. So top of mind is our community and our customers. I just wanted to re-share um, some information on the next slide that most of you already know from MORPC in the Insight 2050 study. Central Ohio is growing. In our careers, our population will double, our households will increase by almost half a million, and our jobs will almost double. And then look what happens right there on the right side of that chart. We go from kind of this middle age, where I, I at least put myself, to a majority younger, under 35, and older population. So in that time, our population completely flips. We will be dealing with younger and older, and they have unique needs. The younger ones believe in service. They want things as a service, software as a service, mobility as a service. Um, they do not want to be in ownership models. And then the aging population may not be able to serve themselves or drive themselves. A snapshot of CODA customers currently, uh, before COVID and after COVID, you'll notice a, a very drastic decrease there in uh, whiter Caucasian, uh, which is really representative of people who have more management type jobs and had the ability uh, to stay home. So we're really uh, focused at the moment until people return to offices on making sure that those who need us most have access to our service. So some emerging services. I want to talk about Central Ohio's first public uh, microtransit service. It's a first mile, last mile solution. It's app based. Currently launched in Westerville, citywide, Grove City, and on the south side of Columbus, serving 16 different neighborhoods in the, the Audubon Park. So if you are in Westerville, Grove City, or South Columbus, download the Coda Plus app, and it will hail an on-demand microtransit vehicle for you the goal is within 15 minutes, our average service delivery is six minutes, we'll be at your doorstop. If you ride it to mass transit, it's no charge. If you ride it point to point, kind of like an Uber, it's a flat fee of $3. It's fully ADA compliant, and there's a phone call option for non-digital customers. This has been a very important strategy for us when we talk about transit and mobility options, because we're facing a demographic who increasingly does not have a driver's license, who does not have access to a car, and we know that we have the ability to have better shared use of roadways. So as our population doubles, I'm pretty sure we're not gonna double the width of our roads and tear down gorgeous buildings and double the width of our interstate, but we are going to find better ways to incorporate shared mobility. And so just something for you to imagine, that same Coda Plus app in Northeast Franklin County and uh, parts of Columbus, Gahanna, New Albany, uh, Easton Town Center and John Glenn, we have found that the Coda Plus on-demand technology works so well, we're beginning to notice more people using on-demand service. So if you're in those areas and download and use Coda Plus, instead of a van, an eight passenger van showing up, a full-size uh, transit vehicle that can hold up to 50 people might show up. We're using new and non-traditional data sources to show that there are more people who need a ride somewhere. It's very different than what fixed route um, type service provides. It really looks at the changing mobility patterns of people. And although this was an idea that we had prior to the pandemic, the interesting thing is our team of engineers accelerated this project by almost two years and deployed it in the middle of the pandemic because we thought about the people first. We realized that this is the time people needed us the most. Yes, it was slated for 2023, but we knew we had people, particularly 
at job centers, distribution centers, hospitals uh, who needed to get to work, but maybe fixed route transit wasn't. available to them because we had suppressed service. So this was just an incredible way for us to take small technology. It's important to give a shout out. Our chief innovation officer and her team worked with our capital and our planning side. And when I think about the executives here at CODA, our chief innovation officer used to be in the software and aviation industry, and she's a computer science engineer. And the head of our capital projects is a civil engineer. And the head of our planning and other divisions and development are mechanical engineers, civil engineers. It's amazing where engineering can take you in your career. So just to, um, just because we're kind of glutton for punishment and there's you know there's just never enough to do, um, we thought on the tails of a pandemic, we would roll out a new fare management system this year in 2021. And what does that actually mean? What it means for those of you who do ride transit right now, there's a little paper ticket you use or there's an old antiquated app. By the end of this year, we'll be completely cashless and you will use either an app or like the Metro in DC, you will use a smart card. And this is a really big challenge for us to switch because almost 52% of our current customers use cash. So how do you go um, cashless in an equitable manner? So the first thing we've looked at, by the end of the year, there on the left-hand side, we have roughly 30 retail spots. By the end of this year, we will have more than 400 additional retail locations embedded in neighborhoods. Just like you can buy a Home Depot gift card at Kroger, you'll be able to reload your Coda card or whatever we call it at grocery stores, CVS, Walgreens, all types of locations. We're even investing in software technology that will allow us to partner with local shops. So if a neighborhood does not have a major grocer or a major retail chain, we'll figure out a way to have it at the local convenience store. So that's a little bit of what we're up to right now, really trying to work on the access part. But I wanna shift a little bit to the why when it comes to engineering. So this is one of my favorite slides about the future. Uh, for those of you who've known the work I've done in the automotive industry, this is the thing that plagues both the automobile makers and then it should be plaguing us as infrastructure geeks, is that this is what it takes for 60 single occupant uh, vehicles the, the amount of space right there in the middle. So whether you use an Uber, whether you use Coda, whatever service, same amount of space. And everyone thinks that autonomy is gonna be this huge solution for us. And it's gonna solve a lot of problems, particularly on the safety side, but we have to be thinking about access and appropriate use of our infrastructure. Because an empty autonomous vehicle on the right-hand side there can take up just as much road space as a single occupant car that you see there on the left-hand side. So many of you have probably heard about Link Us. As we went through the Insight 2050 planning process with Morpsey, the city of Columbus, developers in the private sector, we learned about our community growing. And since then, it has merged into the Link Us in initiative, which is focused on making sure we have complete mobility systems, different development patterns, We'll focus on certain key regional corridors, but we have to be talking about the whole system. What type of transit, tech, bicycle, pedestrian, greenways, housing and commercial developments, how it's going to be done as a system to accommodate the growth that we're expecting in the next couple of decades. Just a really quick overview of a couple of the corridor projects, the Northwest Corridor being led by the city of Columbus. They are amazing partners. And most of you may know the 315 corridor. Um, must A lot of us know it because of going to certain football games. But when you look along that corridor, there is already 18 million square feet of commercial development proposed to be built. 18 million, $3 billion of capital investment. That is the size of a, a mid-sized city that is going to be built right under our noses in the next couple of years. So we have to figure out how to better utilize our infrastructure. The city has been absolutely masterful in convening CODA, Franklin County, major partners along the corridor at looking of how traffic and multimodal transportation system use 
can be designed to accommodate that type of growth. On the east-west corridor, CODA is uh, partnered with the same uh, city of Columbus in Morpsey. We're very grateful to have their support on planning and engineering studies. For most of you who know the east and the west, we've got some really big infrastructure there, and there's a better way for us to reuse it. So you'll see later this year that we will be uh, doing public engagement opportunities of deciding how to better use um, the West Broad, East Broad, or East Main Street corridors with multimodal mixed use. I feel like it's important to give a shout out to Morpsey and the Central Ohio Greenways Board for the vision that they launched with the region regional trails, proposing 500 additional miles of trails throughout Central Ohio connecting all of our Central Ohio communities. This is a really important part of the transportation network. Uh, it's in demand, millennials, retirees, families, people just looking for a higher quality of life. And I anticipate that that will be more the norm. And I so appreciated uh, Mandy highlighting the Scioto Trail because there were times during the pandemic when I walked that trail and I thought to myself, this was not here just five years ago. And I am so grateful that it gave me a place to leave the office and, and decompress at times. So I wanted to just uh, close with the concept of link us. There's a lot of engineering involved in that, but back to the why, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that it needs to unite us and we need to be thinking about people and outcomes first. I, I suspect that all of us can think back to our engineering careers or the start of it in education. And I can quote you things from the L&D manual or the OMUTCD or the LRFD manual in steel class. But I don't think anyone really took time to talk to us about the why. We have prioritized the number of wheels and speed in transportation for far too long. And that has led us to some pretty dire situations, not only with um, the deaths and the, um, the major crashes, the economic impact, we lose almost $1.5 billion a year in Central Ohio due to um, traffic uh, accidents, accidents and um, congestion. And we also, if you could go back a slide, um, we also, um, need to acknowledge that transportation is a thread that can help us develop thriving communities. And we need to be equitable in the access. Particularly to transportation, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that our transportation systems at one point tore some neighborhoods apart and it's time for us to rebuild and reconnect people to jobs and economic prosperity. So I'm really excited about the Link Us initiative and all of the partners we have so far. And I hope that you will do some research and uh, visit the Link Us website and learn more about how walkable, uh, high capacity rapid transit partnered with vision zero principles of enhanced pedestrian crossings, multimodalism, commercial real estate development and affordable housing can really help transform our community. I mentioned earlier that we're really refocused at CODA about connecting technology to people. So I just wanted to give you one example of that. I'm a big um, big believer that all of us who went to school a couple years ago um, need to maintain our engineering skills. I did not learn coding uh, in, in school. As a matter of fact, my kids don't understand how I even exist and was raised without the internet or a cell phone. Um, I certainly didn't know much about artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and the threats that we as everyday citizens uh, are vulnerable to because we have this. And so here we're doing um, an internal job to make sure that we all are developing our skills and becoming more proficient. And we're partnering with other agencies and other companies where we don't have skill sets. So we all, uh, in the transportation industry know that traffic safety and congestion is an issue, but it's always trending up no matter what we do, no matter how many turn lanes, no, no matter how many widenings, it the numbers always get worse. Uh, we have seen some incredible work out in Nevada and Las Vegas where artificial intelligence has been deployed across half of the state to do traffic management. And instead of being passive or responsive, it's actually predictive. So we are partnered with uh, many of our municipal authorities across a 13 county region. Uh, we pursued a federal grant 
to deploy artificial intelligence systems on top of the existing traffic management systems. And you might say, why would you care? Why would you want to do that? Well, Transit in Central Ohio has never been really connected into the systems other than being a user of the traffic management. So we're really keen on making sure customers using our service and others in their private vehicles have the same access to traffic mitigation strategies. Here on the next slide, it will share with you a little bit about what the artificial intelligence will do. We know that we have actionable insights on the right-hand side where we have interagency coordination, but there were some really crazy things that I learned while I was out uh, in Nevada. Like sometimes people will actually tweet about an accident before they will call 911. Like who would have ever thought? So the AI actually um, mines data from all types of non-traditional data sources, things that we as engineers or traffic engineers may have never thought of as being an insight. It aggregates the data, applies um, me mechanisms, and then makes recommendations to those same agencies on the front side. For example, you can position emergency services to help slow down traffic so that people understand that they need to drive safer. The average response time when um, artificial intelligence is engaged in uh, predicting traffic accidents um, usually is cut by more than um, 30%. So when you're talking about important response times after an accident, there's also been a reduction of almost 17% in accidents in Southern Nevada by applying artificial intelligence to predictive, um, as a predictive mechanism as opposed to um, a post response. So imagine the day when we can actually predict behavior and prevent the accident from happening at all. If you don't know, or if you don't believe in that, I can tell you what I've seen from the automotives, it's coming. Um, just a, a quick snapshot of some of our funding partners in a big thank you, uh, because in engineering, no one ever taught me that you'd have to go find the money to do the great things that we do. Uh, so we had incredible partners who helped us pursue that federal grant. And lastly, I just would like to close with what I began with. Or begin with, um, I want to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion in our commitment. We are absolutely committed to being a voice and a champion in this community to raise others up and to make sure that barriers are removed for those who may not have had the same opportunities as us. We will be publishing our diversity statistics. It will be in our annual report. And we will make sure that people know that we are making progress in areas that we are not good enough. These are the statistics of our employees by race. I don't think gender is on here, although I do know that we are 33% female, which is almost triple the national standard. It's usually in the 10 to 15% range when it comes to the transportation industry. So I'm very proud that we are making sure that women have paths to careers in transportation and mobility here. And I would challenge each of you to take a look at your companies, our service organizations, and even events like this. What is it that led you into engineering and how did you get there? Were it not for someone telling me that I could do it, I certainly would not have thought to go into engineering because you have to see it to believe it. And if you don't see women in engineering, I can assure you that you as a woman don't think that you can do it. If you do not see minorities in engineering, then I can assure you, I have staff here actually who've said, I never told anyone or no, no one ever told me that they believed in me. I did not know that I could pursue this career. So I hope that each of you will challenge yourselves to think about what you are doing to make sure you're making the table bigger and inviting others in. Mandy mentioned this uh, briefly. Again, back to engineering and problem solving. Never thought I'd be in the food distribution business. Never thought I'd be in the Wi-Fi business. Never thought I'd be in the mass distribution business. But when the pandemic threw us a monkey wrench and COSI had to close their doors, they said, what can we do to get education and STEM into the hands of all the kids who are at home? Well, what's the number one barrier to kids' education right now? Lack of uh, equitable broadband access. So we retrofitted our buses. All of our buses currently have free Wi-Fi if you ever ride Coda. And we increased the signal. So COSI and Coda showed up in neighborhoods with socially distanced spots and passed out um, COSI on wheels curbside kits and made sure 
that kids could download the new app that COSI developed, which works offline without Wi-Fi. So that one touch point led to an entire summer of learning for many children. Same thing with Bob Evans food distribution. Um, I think Mandy mentioned it earlier. If you are not aware, there are more than 35,000 families in central Ohio who had to use the food bank for the first time in their history. So we made sure we got food to people. And this continues with the National Veterans Memorial and Museum who receives emergency food um, on occasion, on demand, uh, when uh, restaurants and distribution centers have access. And our Veterans Employee Resource Group, an amazing team, usually within six hours of being told that food's on the way at the Veterans Memorial here on West Broad, our team show up, they collect it, they help pack it, and they help ship it out. And lastly, mask distribution. Uh, it, I think it, we all have our masks now, but if you remember at one point in time, nobody could find masks. We were the, one of the first, if not the first transit agency in the nation to mandate masks back on April 16th of 2020. And it became a real equity issue with people saying, how am I going to use your system if I don't have a mask? So we have an incredible community relations team that collected more than 35,000 masks from companies across Central Ohio and then distributed them to nonprofits to make sure that all of our customers have what they need in order to build or in order to board our system. And lastly, I mentioned our commitment to sustainability. By 2025, we'll be 100% low or no vehicles. We're moving into the electric space. And this includes the number one issue that uh, is plaguing all of us who think it would be really cool to get, go electric. If you think it's um, a, a cost benefit ratio and a difficult challenge or conversation to have with your partner at home about whether to install a plug in the garage, imagine installing plugs big enough <laughs> to recharge a half a million dollar computer on wheels. Uh, but we're underway and by the end of 2022, we will have 30 heavy duty EV charging stations in place. We've also installed 18 EV charging stations at our park and ride locations through Central Ohio and we continue to do more. And we're also looking at how to join Sustainable Columbus in the carbon neutrality pledge, trying to get our community carbon neutral by 2050. And if you're not aware, there was just a community choice aggregation uh, plan that was put together by some seriously wicked engineers and business leaders in our community that is going to switch your choice to 100% clean renewable energy by 2022. And I suggest you opt in. Here at CODA, we plan to be gen our buildings and our facilities to be run by completely renewable energy by 2022. And I'm just gonna close with that because I want to um, just say that engineering I know that we are all a little biased, but engineering really is the coolest trade. I think we're at an incredible moment in time, particularly in Central Ohio, uh, where innovation really can lead us to a more prosperous, a more equitable, and a more sustainable future. And I would challenge you to get your nose out of the manuals and to not rely on the equations only and to use your thinking skills in the way that we've been trained to ask why and to be thinking about the people. And that's it. Thank you, Joanna. What a great presentation. And uh, and really, thank you for your leadership. Coda is in great hands. Um, I do love being an engineer, too. I, I've been in the business for 35 years. And one thing I like about it is um, I'm always learning new things every day, you know, and I just I'm passionate about it as you are and uh, love what I do. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, somebody asked, uh, what will Coda's role be in the future? light rail system for the Columbus area. Okay, just make sure you repeat it again. I It broke up just a little in the middle. Sure. Yeah, it says, uh, what will CODA's role be in the future light rail system for the Columbus area? So um, light rail as a mode um, was put on, I believe it was a ballot initiative in 1999, um, and it was voted down by the public. Um, so the Linkus initiative, we are evaluating high capacity rapid transit along corridors and we will be taking public input and we will be determining which mode uh, will be the right mode for the community based on not only the cost, but what the community um, understands to be the best value for what they need, which often, as you would imagine, is access to job centers, travel time, and of course the safety. 
Um, I get the question about light rail a, a lot, and I always respond with the same thing about, um, I believe that the rails are digital now. I think connected vehicle systems, so whether there's a piece of steel embedded in the highway um, or whether it's a digital connection that has the vehicles connected, which I think is more likely, um, our role with our partners will be in evaluating uh, what modes to put along each of those corridors. Thank you for the question. That was a good one. Okay, and here's another one. Uh, somebody asked, what about putting charging stations for the cars at the local schools and colleges? That is a great question. And we actually have terrific partnerships um, with The Ohio State University, Columbus State, Franklin, Otterbein. I know that Colum Ohio State University is putting charging stations in. So I'll be sure and ask about the others. Columbus State's about to embark on a huge capital investment program. So that would be a very good conversation to have with them. At the public school level, I'll be really frank. Uh, I am not familiar with their capital, capital plan. I do know that a significantly higher portion of their students in Central Ohio use uh, busing, so they use mass transportation. So that would be a question primarily, I think, for the teachers and the administration. But when I talk to the school superintendent next, I'll be sure and ask her. Great, thank you. I think that's uh, all the questions we have for you. There is a question for Mandy. And, and again, Mandy, I don't know if you're available, but um, somebody asked, how has your team been able to help Columbus see transportation as a citywide priority over all the many competing interests for public funding? Well, I think, I think, no, I think definitely um, one of the biggest benefits is we do have a protected funding source uh, that is dedicated to working in, uh, is dedicated for transportation, primarily streets and bridges. Um, I think transportation is something also that really touches so many people's lives uh, and people are very familiar with how it relates to their world. So when you're talking about transportation uh, projects, programs, and making an investment, people really truly see them as an investment in themselves and in their community. So it's often a priority, whether it be a conversation about speeding in a neighborhood and working to put in uh, traffic calming measures, or whether it's a conversation about connected vehicle technology that we've placed on High Street, Morse Road, and Cleveland Avenue. Uh, people really relate to transportation because it's something they use almost every single day. Great, thank you. And somebody asked a question here. Um, I think it might be for Joanna. Um, any new parking garage at OSU has a charging station within it? Yes, my understanding is that the new parking garages do have charging stations. Um, I remember just at the time I left, the Center for Automotive Research went from two to six stations. So that is part of the camp campus master plan, to my knowledge. Okay, great. And then uh, somebody asks, are the electric charging stations to be supplied by solar and wind or the grid in general? So the charging stations that we have installed at COTA um, will be grid-based, but as I mentioned, we are switching to 100% uh, renewable by 2022. Great, thank you. Well, I think that's uh, all the questions we have for now, but um, thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedules and presenting today. They were both great. Great presentations. I'm getting a lot of feedback here on the chat thing here. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the 2021 Central Ohio E-Week Luncheon. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed today's event and learned something. We want to thank our speakers for taking the time to present today and to Cornell Robertson, Dr. Marchbanks, and Julia Hart for their participation in today's webinar. A special thanks goes out to all of our sponsors for their support as well. Lastly, I would like to thank the EWE committee members and Victoria Beal and Paula Hyman from ODOT LTAP for their time and effort to put together this event. Enjoy the rest of Engineers Week and stay safe and healthy. So long. Okay.